from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, so we're going to move on to the second panel, which is on ownership and contractual issues. Uh, the goal of this panel is to explore the state of contract law vis-a-vis -vis software enabled everyday products and how contracts such as end user license agreements impact investment in and the dissemination and use of everyday products including whether any legislative action is necessary. Um, so before we start uh, we should first introduce um, the new member to our section Good morning. I'm Eric Burton. I'm the Deputy Director for Registration here at the Copyright Office. Um, and we should also have the new members on the panel introduce themselves and their affiliations. So if we could start with you, uh, Mr. Perzanowski. Uh, my name is Aaron Perzanowski. I'm a professor of law at Case Western Reserve at uh, University uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I've been thinking and writing uh, about issues uh, concerning uh, consumer ownership of digital goods for a long time. And Mr. Harbison? Uh, I'm Eric Harbison from the Music Library Association. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, after reading the comments we've received um, in this area, we've identified two areas of particular interest. Um, first, what are the legal or practical rationales for employing end user license agreements or other types of agreements in the context of software enabled consumer products? And second, are such agreements having any practical effect in the marketplace in terms of limiting the availability of exceptions and limitations under the Copyright Act? So um, if anyone would like to start uh, addressing one or both of those issues, that'd be great. Uh, so Mr. Bergmeier. Yeah, so uh, I think one of the issues with uh, software in particular is that where it goes beyond uh, contract law is that if the uh, seller of a software product or a software-enabled product is in some way saying that you never, the buyer never actually owns the copy, uh, that doesn't just affect uh, the relationship between the seller and the buyer. It has downstream effects uh, because the first sale doctrine then never kicks in and people who are not privy to the, to, the, to the sales contract between the seller and the buyer uh, would also be infringing copyright uh, for later distributions. So I think that is one of the particularly uh, dangerous areas with uh, the notion that a seller of a software product can reserve ownership. And also, uh, I think you'll see in a lot of the comments, there was agreement that uh, the law doesn't need to change, but different people have a different idea of what the law means. Uh, when I say the law doesn't need to change, I think that these uh, parallel doctrines that have come up where software vendors, uh, uniquely among all copyright holders, have the ability to sell you something and say that they didn't really sell it to you, that has no basis in the statute, it defies common sense and legal logic, and yet we've allowed it to uh, grow up in the software industry to sort of arrange its business models around this legal concept where in other areas, uh, plenty of other sellers of copyrighted products have tried to do the exact same thing and they've been smacked down by the courts. Uh, you know, the foundational first sale case is about the attempt to uh, withhold uh, rights, uh, resale rights from customers. Uh, the the people who have given people sample music have tried to say, well, you can't resell this because you don't really own it. And courts have taken the very common sense view that if you're transferring a physical item to someone for keeps, that means they own it. And just sort of uh, boilerplate language in a sales agreement between a seller and a buyer can't really change that basic economic reality. And uh, it is this, it, you know, this is the issue that sort of got me uh, involved in this area. Uh, you know, I first started looking about this stuff in the Werner case, which I think came out the wrong way. And I think if we just revisit uh, these doctrines, which are judge made and have no basis in the statute, we can undo a lot of the real and potential consumer harm. So can I, I mean, so, I'm, you know, when, when I reread Werner, I mean, there, the, Werner is based on a, on a, 
on an older case from 1977 called WISE, which didn't involve uh, software, it involved uh, motion picture prints. And what the court basically said there was, I mean, it reached, it, 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 it sort of reversed the um, convictions, I think, in that case on other grounds. But it did say that, you know, they, 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 it, the, the court discussed the sort of VIP prints of motion pictures, um, like Sting and Funny Girl, and said that, you know, those could be licensed. And so, so I'm just wondering what you say about, I mean, just to your point that this is something that's unique to software, I'm just wondering sure. whether you could address sort of yeah, why and, 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 and it's a reasoning. There absolutely can be situations where I sort of transfer physical custody of a physical item uh, to, to a buyer or another person where they don't really own it. But I think there have to be facts to support that. It can't just be a routine, like I just sort of add it to every single thing that I sell. There has to be some sort of... Uh, verifiable requirement that they destroy it after use or that they return it or there has to be some sort of uh, reality to that. It can't just be something that anytime anyone buys a consumer product, the example that I pulled out was uh, in our comments, but I could have found it in probably any product is the Nest thermostat uh, li uh, license, which simultaneously says that you, the buyer, don't really own this. You don't own the copy of the software, which you know is a physical thing because copies are always material objects. Uh, but it also describes you as the buyer, and it's just contradictory, and it's just put there as a matter of course uh, in all software that is sold to consumers. And I think that's the problem. Not that there might be exceptional circumstances where, yeah, you know, if you're giving it back or if you're really just renting it or it's in a unique market that has particular characteristics like film prints, uh, but I think it is the universalization of this, what should be an exceptional circumstance that's the problem. So uh, just a couple of points I'm just curious about. So, I mean, in Werner, there was, the, as, as I recall, there was a requirement that the purchaser destroy the copies when they, per the original copies when they purchased the upgrades. So there was, the court did mention that sort of restriction, which seems to me similar to what was yeah, issued in the Yeah, but at the same time, you can't just say that you're required, but there's no actual enforcement. I mean, as far as I know, if you just say that just adding a requirement of destruction to a contract is enough to get you into that special circumstance, then people will just add that every time, and it won't really be enforced. I think the point is that there has to be an economic reality that controls whether or not a sale has taken place, not merely uh, words. So and, uh, just a follow-up question. So if it, it, I wonder if you could, so what the, what the software folks say is that, well, if we can't license it, then things like academic versions of uh, software become unviable, where, you know, you, 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 you sell someone a you know, $149 copy of Microsoft Word with the understanding that they're not going to use it for commercial purposes. If you don't have some sort of license, that so enforces two that, right. So two things, you can still have a contract, just the contract only applies to the person who ended, who entered into the contract and it doesn't apply to all potential downstream users. So if you do sell some, something to someone at a discount and then they're just up and reselling it into the general market, you can use contract law to go after them. But I think it would be inappropriate to go five owners down the line and start using copyright against people who have no idea and never entered into that contract. Uh, and second, you know, yes, there are certain business models that might be easier for sellers if they have certain legal rights, but that doesn't, that's not a slam dunk argument that those rights should exist. And in fact, in other areas like books and textbooks, we do have special academic editions or pricing, and it seems to work just fine. Uh, there is no uh, concept that when you buy a textbook, uh, you don't really own it. And in fact, uh, you know, I think anyone who used to be a student uh, thinks it's great that you can buy a used textbook or sell your textbook when you're done with it. And I just don't see why we need special software-specific doctrines except when they are specifically codified by statute, where this notion that you don't own a thing that you bought does not come from the statute. That is entirely uh, a judge-made doctrine. Um, well, why don't we act, uh, move on to Mr. Band? Thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, for for ORI, where this the relationship of contract uh, to this issue is most uh, uh, obvious is the first sale doctrine, which applies to owners of copies. And so, if you have um, software embedded in the device, and the software is just licensed but not sold, then the first sale doctrine uh, arguably does not apply to that piece of software, and so you can't transfer uh, 
um, uh, transfer the software when you're transferring the rest of the good, and so that makes it difficult to sell uh, to sell the, uh, uh, the the product in, in the secondary market, and so that's you know really where w we see that issue. And 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 as John said, uh, really the, the economic realities of the transaction are that um, uh, when you buy the device, you're buying the copy of the software in it. You're not expected to return it, and and it it, uh, 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 it, it, it seems that obviously that that you know if you're able to keep the device uh, for its useful life, uh, let's say if it's 10 years, but let's say, you know, it, then if you want to, after five years, sell it to someone else who could benefit from the other five years, you should be able to do so. Um, and, and so, uh, 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 but, but when you have a contract, when you have this contractual restriction, not only do you have the problem that it, you, that could be breaching the contract, but on top of that, you're not able to take advantage of the first sale doctrine. So. Figuring out the the license piece is is uh, or, or or this contractual piece is critical to allowing the alien alienability of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, piece of personal property, um, and then just the, the the secondarily, you know, we had talked in the in the last session a lot about people talking about reverse engineering and and interoperability and how. Uh, that isn't uh, uh, how, how the, the copyright law is so clear on that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next session. But I just wanted to point out that uh, almost every piece of software that's distributed, whether uh, a, a just as on a standalone basis or if it's in a device, the license agreement almost always contains a prohibition on reverse engineering for any purpose. So. You know, it's, it's all well and good that the jurisprudence says that it might not be a copyright infringement, but if you have this, uh, 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 the, these pervasive uh, license agreements that prohibit you from uh, engaging in that activity, uh, obviously there's a tension. Um, now, the question is, to get into the second question, you know, what has been the real impact about, on that? Now, with respect to these uh, restrictions on uh, reverse engineering, the license restrictions, you know, there has been litigation. There was the Bowers v. Bay State case. And one of the issues there was, uh, is the, is the, uh, the license prohibition on reverse engineering is it preempted? And, you know, the truth is that's, uh, you know, in that, in that case, two judges say not preempted. One judge said, yes, it is preempted. Um, uh, I think that that's one of those really complicated areas that, uh, that that I, I would hope this study would start delving into about this this relationship of of, of when are contract terms preempted by uh, by the the Copyright Act and 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 think of, and starting to think about that and look at that more. Um, but 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 I, I I think that that is an issue that you know when you counsel clients you have to talk about. It. You say well there's this argument there's that argument and you know do what you need to do. And I I have a feeling a lot of you know, there are some people who do go ahead and reverse engineer and sort of hope that it's uh, in the event that, the, that there's a litigation that it will be found to be preempted. Um, and I, I imagine there are other people who are more uh, risk averse and uh, uh, are, are not reverse engineering because they don't want to take that risk. Sorry, is it your understanding that a violation of such a contract term against reverse engineering would be... Um, would be just a breach of contract, or would that be, is that somehow tied to copyright infringement? Well, I think there's case law that would suggest that it could be both, I meaning if it, if it seemed to be, if it's a, if it's a valid restriction and you're, uh, you know, I, I think there, there, there is case law that would suggest that it would be not only, it would both be a breach of contract and a uh, copyright violation, a copyright infringement. Sorry, even if it were otherwise fair use? I mean, if the reverse engineering were deemed to be fair use, it would still be... Right. I, I could. I, I, again, the argument would be because you're going against. You're, you're, you don't have the. You, you might have the copyright. You would have had the copyright right, but because you have, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you agreed not to do it. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not. I would. I, I would. Uh, 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 I, I think it would be. You know, it would be a, an issue to be determined. But I think that there certainly there would be some who would argue that that would be a. Uh, an infringement as well. Sort of taking a step back from the legal issues and, and getting into the specifics, um, in terms of these these licenses, 
how prevalent are they? How often do they have sort of restrictive um, language about reverse engineering or restrictive language that sort of is specific to copyright? Uh, I would say that I, I obviously haven't done a complete survey, but I would I would be shocked if the vast majority of programs that are distributed, you know, whether by uh, 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 you know, you know, uh, do, you know, I would be surprised if they didn't have those restrictions. Certainly, every license that I have seen, every software license that I have seen, includes a prohibition on reverse engineering. It is, you know, as John was saying, it, you know, this is boilerplate. You just automatically include it. I'm sure all of uh, Mr. Zuck's members, when they distribute, or the vast majority, when they distribute their apps, I mean, it's just, you know, it's it's. It's part of the it's part of the template. Do you prohibit people from reverse engineering? Well, just as a as sort of a, a data point, um, you know, not to bring up the four letter word, but in the twelve one rulemaking proceeding, we um, had a finding that for ECUs um, in in automobiles that um, there were no licenses associated with those at the time. So we're it, it would be very helpful to us to have sort of specific examples of, of industries or, or specific contracts themselves that um, are attached to these products and sort of the, the restrictive um, covenants that, that um, are in, the, in those agreements. Well, well so I know, I, I can't speak from the, for the automotive industry because I'm not as familiar with that, but I certainly know in the computer area, almost whenever you're buying, uh, certainly, uh, uh, um, Whenever you're when you're acquiring the device, the the computer, and then certainly whenever you're you know all those licenses that you're always clicking on, whenever you're you know any update you get, you're clicking on a license. Uh, 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 of course, I never bother reading that. Just like none of us ever read any of those licenses that we're clicking on our agreement to. But I would be surprised if all of those software licenses did not include a prohibition on reverse engineering. Um, I'd like to open that question to to everyone just to get a sense of because you know we understand that this these exist in the general software context, but to sort of narrow the inquiry into sort of software enabled consumer products and how prevalent this is in that context would be inc incredibly helpful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I. I uh, debated whether to respond simply because I don't have any data, I don't have any information in terms of how prevalent uh, reverse engineering prohibitions are in embedded software licenses as opposed to other types of software licenses and not to mention the difficulty that we talked about in the first session about making that distinction between software and embedded software. But um, uh, uh, I, I, I actually will not disagree with Mr. Band in terms of the fact that the reverse engineering prohibitions you do find them in many, many, if not virtually all, uh, software licenses. And there's a reason for that, which is most people don't care about reverse engineering. When you get like mass market software included in embedded software, how many people want to go ahead and reverse engineer the software in their toaster or their, or their thermostat, as the example was used before, or, or something like that. It allows software companies to go ahead and, and with a certain level of comfort, um, be able to include their software in those products. So there are significant benefits, not only to the software companies, not only to the hardware manufacturers, but most importantly, their benefits to most consumers. Along those lines, what are the draw the benefits and the drawbacks of um, having these these license agreements attached to the products then uh, beyond sort of it, both in the copyright context and outside of the copyright context? So, so you're talking about b beyond just reverse engineering now in terms of the value of these these licenses. I mean, I think it's important to 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 note that the you know the software license um, will be is one component in if we're talking about embedded software in the larger scheme of things in terms of the, the, the hardware itself. And if you look at a lot of these so software licenses, for instance, they did, we talked about transfer and prohibition on transfer. Most of them actually do allow transfer. They may have certain conditions uh, attached to those transfers. And a lot of those have to do uh, with, uh, you know, with consumer 
you know, consumer protections perhaps more than anything. I think it was interesting that the uh, gentleman from, from Public Knowledge uh, and, 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 and um, I think maybe Jonathan as well, maybe, talked about the fact that value in or, or in, in having to return the product or having to destroy the product. Um, and I thought it was really, really interesting the fact that um, the uh, from gentleman from Public Knowledge talked about his big issue was that there was no actual enforcement of that. And, oh, my gosh, I mean, I, I, you know, um, Public Knowledge, I... I, I, I understand represents consumers, but now it's encouraging software companies to go knocking on consumers' doors and saying, did you destroy that? And, and uh, I don't think that's anything anybody wants to do, um, it, certainly not consumers and not, not the software industry. So in terms of having to return the software to prove that it's a license makes very little practical sense. Um, uh, and it's just a burden on consumers and frankly a burden on the software owners. They're also having to destroy it um, uh, uh, also, uh, you know, comes with its, its difficulties as well in terms of, okay, you know, do you then have to prove that it was destroyed or, or something like that? And when you're talking about a lot of these software products, at the pace that technology is moving, uh, do you really need to destroy that software to prove that this is a license? At some point, very, very soon, that software is going to be obsolete anyway and have to be updated. I mean, we talked about a little bit of how quickly software is updated and how quickly technology moves. So do, why do we need these sort of artificial, um, uh, to include these artificial requirements to show that something, the license? I, I, I do think the Werner test is the uh, good test, is an, is an accurate test of when something, uh, when the software license should be uh, enforced under the copyright law and when it shouldn't. So can I, can I ask you the question I asked, um, I think it was Mr. Band, which was if, if someone violates a, a ban on uh, reverse engineering, if that reverse engineering would otherwise be fair use, is that is that a, just a violation of the contract, or is that a, is that a copyright infringement? Yeah, so I, I would have a hard time believing that would be a copyright infringement where you have a court saying that this is fair use. I mean, I don't see how that's possible. Um, I don't know that we've had any litigation in that area, but so I take a slightly or maybe totally different view than Mr. Band on that particular issue. Well, I assume that's an answer that would make Mr. Band happy. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're advocating for each other. <laughs> that, that was a joke for the record. <laughs> well, why don't we move um, around the room since we have a lot of tent cards up. Um, so we'll move on with uh, Mr. Harbison. Uh, I do want to speak. I just want to make sure that uh, I'm, I'm going to be going to back to the top level question. So make sure that we're. Um, I, I want to thank the office for, for letting me come here to speak because um, I, I am representing the Music Library Association, which you might not expect to see at a uh, hearing <laughs> called Software Enabled Consumer Products. Um, and we're here because we believe that the, the, notwithstanding its name, this study is bigger than software related consumer products. And is, is a, it, I, I, so I'd like to invite the room to, to take to go to a one up a level of abstraction and think of this in terms of, of the broader way in which we're allowing l contracts to affect, uh, to, to, to allowing non-negotiable um, end user license agreements especially to create a parallel system of copyright without the limitations and exceptions that are built in. And we've al you've already been discussing this a fair amount. I want to, to raise our issue, which is the, that in many cases, there are, uh, there, there is music and especially sound recordings, which have for, for, for years and years and years, libraries have been collecting this music on disc and then tape and then tape and then disc again. Um, and we've, lent it and we've done, we've, we've taken care of it, we've preserved it, we've, we've done all of the things that libraries do. Um, along comes the, the, the digital distribution services such as uh, iTunes and Amazon, uh, then you have Spotify's of the world, and in, in some cases uh, we have found that 
music distributors are deciding only to distribute their music, their sound recordings especially, through these services. I'm, I'm actually just talking about sound recordings, not musical works. Uh, only looking to distribute their sound recordings through these services. Now, in a case where they are also distributed on a physical medium that we can purchase, that's not a problem. We can buy them, we can distribute them the way we always have. But when they're only distributed through these digital distribution services, and that's the only way the public can have access to these sound recordings, uh, that creates a big problem for libraries, and this, is, this has been on the verge of a trend. It's not quite there yet. It is not, however, a parade of horribles. It's actually in the record. We have a, a, on the record uh, a, a, a link in our comments. We have a link to a, a list of works that we've collected um, that are being distributed this way. Uh, in particular, I'd like to put on, on if, to, to, to discuss one that we discussed in our comments, which is the case of a Grammy award-winning sound recording uh, of uh, Gustavo Dudamel and the Los Angeles Philharmonic. We've raised this in, uh, in uh, copyright office proceedings before. This is a Gr Grammy award-winning sound recording uh, produced by Deutsche Grammophon in which a couple of, of our members spent a lot of grant money trying to track down a license for this. Uh, it was only being distributed in, by, Amaz by iTunes and the iTunes software license makes it impossible for libraries to enter into the agreement because it's for end users only when libraries are not end users. Uh, furthermore, even if we could enter into the agreement, it doesn't let us do anything with it. So our, my colleagues at the University of Washington spent a lot of time tracking down the, uh, uh, the someone who could give, us, give them a license. Uh, they, they went to iTunes and iTunes said, you have to talk to Deutsche Grammophon, Deutsche Grammophon, you had to talk to, I think, Universal. And finally, after a large uh, tr train of, of um, a lot of work, they finally tracked down, I think it was, yes, it was Universal Music Group, which, and I quote the, the, the article that my colleagues published, they agreed to license the material under the following conditions, that no more than 25% 20 of the album's content could be licensed and the license would be valid for no more than two years. Furthermore, a $250 processing fee would be charged in addition to the unspecified licensing fee that would have been more than the processing fee. So now we're over $500 for a two-year license for not even the entire work for a Grammy Award-winning sound recording. Um, for, and for, uh, for a work that uh, the public could purchase for $10 on Amazon. Well, purchase for $10 on Amazon. Libraries do important work. We cannot allow this, th these kinds of licenses to circumvent the good work that libraries do. Right now, the problem is, is only in music libraries that we know of with sound recordings, but uh, th there are numerous uh, companies that are putting out digital works and who knows when they'll stop making CDs or DVDs. I keep hearing about the forthcoming death of the CD. So I, 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 we are advocating for a very m narrow exception to the law that would allow th those, the provisions of, of non-negotiable licenses to, be, to not be enforceable only in the event that they, they are, um, th there is no other means for a library to, inc uh, to acquire it. And I can talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arbison. Um, I'd like to ask a, a broader question, and, and maybe this speaks to uh, the issues you've raised or, or others may want to jump in. And that's the question of, of privity of contract. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're taking a license uh, for the software that's embedded in the product that you purchase, uh, what impact, if any, does that have on uh, the, the, the downstream users, as Mr. Ban raised earlier? Are they bound by these same licensing agreements? Do they run with the product itself? Or is this an issue of contract, as Mr. Berkmeyer suggested, that there's a distinction between licensing and contract, which I'm not quite sure I see the difference there? 
to answer that question, uh, I think it's pretty simple. A license is just permission to do something you otherwise don't have the legal right to do, and conditions can be put on that, but it's simply uh, unilateral. Uh, there's no need for there to be a meeting of the minds or consideration on both sides or anything like that. Well, as a contract is a contract that you like you learn about in law school. I think in software, typically you have one agreement, which is both. Um, you know, just to just to answer sort of your questions, I think the failure to distinguish between a license and a contract and the allowance in the software context uniquely of uh, sellers to reserve ownership rights of physical goods that they sell uh, leads to issues like uh, the court in MDY uh, ended up saying, okay, well, we don't want to say that any single tiny minor violation of a contractual term automatically leads to copyright infringement in the case of software, because in the case of software, if you don't own it, you need a license to operate it, and you, need, you simply need a license to use the product in its ordinary course, and the court really saw the consequences of that would be pretty bad, so they said, oh, okay, well, you actually have to look at it, and you have to determine, is this a covenant on a license, or is it a contractual condition, and you have to sort of piece together and like dissect the document to figure out the difference. Uh, and I think that is a sort of a very difficult task, which you could avoid if you simply get rid of the underlying problem of the reservation of ownership. Because in the normal course of action, like for example, if I'm a movie theater and I violate the contract that allows me to publicly perform a movie and then I publicly perform it anyway, the idea that that kind of contractual violation could give rise to a copyright infringement is not a problem. It only becomes a problem when you need a license simply to use something in its ordinary course of operation, which by all sort of common sense you thought that you owned. So I, I'm not sure if I'm sort of getting at the distinction that I see. Uh, between a, a license, but I think that the, the failure to properly distinguish and understand what a license is versus what a contract is by including federal appellate courts has led us to this very difficult uh, legal situation where it is very difficult to tell where what consumer rights are and whether or not and which particular provisions might run with the chattel, uh, as it were. So what would be your solution to that issue? Would it be sort of, you know, clarifying that regardless of these licenses that, for example, in the context of Section 109 or, or Section 117, that, you know, that you know, the the consumer would be considered an owner in, in those contexts at least. I th yes, I think that is the solution. For the most part, consumers who buy physical items, whether it's uh, media or consumer products, I think they typically own those products. Uh, routinely judges and the common law has historically always said you know things like oh you know this isn't really a sale it's a thousand year lease like that doesn't work like it doesn't matter that the two parties agree amongst themselves and they're sophisticated parties that negotiate and sort of write it down on a piece of paper it's not true you can't make something that is false true just by writing it down and you can't take something that is a sale and label it a not sale and then have all sorts of legal consequences that affect people, including people who are never even privy to that original agreement. Is there a is there a distinction though between the types of contracts that, you know, attempt to expand what we think of as copyright rights and those that are short of that? Um, you know, when we talk about a type of contract that says you can't sell a book for less than a dollar forever, that would be expanding your traditional rights, right? But some of these other, you know licenses that we talk about are short of the full term of copyright, for example. You know, you could use a work, let's say it's a downloaded textbook on your Kindle for the term of your semester. Is there a distinction there? Well, I mean, I think the reason we keep talking about this in the copyright context is because of the RAM copy doctrine, which says that uh, if you're not the owner, you need a license to use a product. And that's not true in any other context. You know, Even if I don't own a book, uh, even if I stole it, simply reading it does not constitute an infringement. Uh, but in the, in the case of software, if you're not the owner of the physical item, the material object, the copy, uh, you need a license. And therefore, all sorts of crazy conditions can be put on that license, and simply infringing any one of them could lead to an instance of copyright infringement. And it's a very software-specific uh, notion that comes out of this concept that simply to use a product in its ordinary course of operation 
so, somehow triggers copyright, and that's true uniquely in software, and I think that's why this is a software-specific uh, problem. I'm not going to say that there can't be other problems with overbroad contracts or licenses, but you know, I'm just really focused on this concept of ownership and RAM copies leading to you know, minor infractions, perhaps leading to copyright infringement in, in the case that's unique to software. Well, we should get some more thoughts yes. on, on these issues, so um, let's move on to Mr. Moore. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's Turn on your. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, several, several points that look nothing like what I was originally going to say. <laughs> um, a, a couple of things. I mean, uh, first of all, I think there's been a fair fair amount of, of of healthy candor that the complaints going on here are far far broader than than what this uh, examination is supposed to be about, which is embedded software. Um, and these are complaints about licensing generally. Um, I've seen reflected a, a greater degree of, of certainty than, I'm, than I have about whether a particular restriction uh, will trigger infringement liability um, because there are, there are covenants and conditions, and covenants trigger contractual liability, and conditions will trigger infringement liability. And so, and then in that context, even if the infringement even if there's an alleged infringement, I'm, I honestly don't know the answer as to whether an affirmative defense in that particular situation might exclude, might excuse that infringement, and then lead only to a contract liability. I don't know. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I think that's that's the way that um, that's one way that the courts could resolve this. Um, the the second thing uh, that I confess some confusion to is knowing when a sale and a license occurs. Uh, the, the, the problem is that there seems to be some uh, belief that there's a unified field theory of software licensing and that every, most, it's true, most pieces of software are licensed, um, but there are situations when they're not, and the courts have done a good job at sorting that out. Different facts different results, different types of media with particular different commercial customs, different results. Um, that seems to have worked reasonably well. Uh, and so <clears throat> now they, they, our friends have problems with the existence of licensing generally, and that's fine. Um, but there's no, but it, it's a big jump to say from there that uh, okay, well, you know, embedded software is a special problem that needs these special rules. It doesn't. And I think that's, I'm not sure that Congress necessarily agrees with that um, premise, and certainly uh, the courts haven't. Um, and then there's finally, there was two little things about ownership um, that I wanted to mention. The first has to do with unforeseen consequences. I mean, I think one of the reasons that open source software works is that because the license restrictions run with the copy. And so if someone becomes an owner of a particular copy, they're no longer bound by the license restrictions. So at that point, how does the community survive? What's the incentive for the, for the open source community to survive? Um, and the second, the, the second thing that struck me, again, in sort of making it out that there's this, oh, there's this software boogeyman, um, that, I'm not sure that's right either because, and an example of that is, um, is 5.12. There are all kinds of works now that are reproduced in RAM. That's not unique to software. And that may be a problem that our friends have with the copyright law generally. But again, that protection of content on computer networks is, frankly, essential to many of my and other folks' members' well-being. Um, and that's not a, that is not a, uh, a particular provision of the law that we're inclined to, to re-examine or application, rather. I had a follow-up question for yep. you, I guess anyone who comes after you, about the, so we're here, we're really trying to limit this to this kind of consumer products and embedded software, which as we heard from the first panel is apparently very difficult, if possible at all, to draw. But a lot of this discussion is really way beyond um, that kind of situation. And Werner and Krauss, they both dealt with the software itself. So you're selling, you know, there was a license for the actual software versus a sale. And I wonder what the opinions would be or the kind of legal analysis could be based on something else. Like you buy the refrigerator, it has some sort of software to make the ice cubes come out or whatnot. Um, when you buy the refrigerator, you're not signing a license or anything. It's just kind of coming through and kind of what the different analysis might be. 
I, I think in that I think in that context, I mean, I the analysis would be um, I would expect it to be context specific. So, in other words, all of those decisions would be made against a backdrop of um, sales of goods that have occurred for for decades. And so, uh, I, I agree. I think slapping a label on a on a um, on a refrigerator saying this this refrigerator is licensed. I'm not sure that would I'm not sure that would work, but that's not what's really happening. I mean, when when that refrigerator contains essentially a functioning computer, and that computer starts develop results in a continuing relationship with the software provider, for example, over I don't know what you had in what what the um, UPC codes are in your that you put in your refrigerator and now it knows what you've been eating, how often you're eating, whether or not you're off your diet plan, all of this other kinds of personal information. That's an appropriate, very appropriate uh, situation for a license agreement. That is also um, a way that the manufacturer maintains the integrity of its product by kind of setting the terms under which that relationship occurs. They're entitled to do that. And if consumers don't like that relationship, there's no, they can go and buy a different refrigerator. You know, that's why we don't see this as a, uh, you know, we don't, as a group, we, we generally don't see a problem here. It's a, it's, it seems to be working okay. Uh, Mr. Zuck. Thanks. Uh, it, 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 you do come around uh, past what you originally thought you were going to say by the time the discussion evolves. But um, I, I think that, again, taking a kind of step back, there's the, there's the entire history of the software industry that comes into play when looking at one of the, some of the standard practices that we see, like um, pro, you know, prohibitions on reverse engineering. And, and you have to remember that that's a legacy of, of tremendous amounts of software piracy and people just trying to empower themselves in any way possible to try and stem the flow of that. I, I also think that it's a little bit specious to say that a copy, a digital copy of something is really the same thing as a, a, a physical object. And, and where this uh, really bears itself out is that enterprises, for example, um, have one copy of a piece of software and can buy multiple licenses for its use. These are different keys, et cetera, that I put in to make use of the software. So it's a little bit like you're allowed to make as many copies of this encrypted book uh, as you want to, but what I'm going to sell you is uh, is the is the key that allows you to uh, decrypt, uh, you know, the which letters to read to read the book or something like that, right? And so um, I think there is a distinction, and it has allowed for very dynamic business in terms of business models. Whether you, the example you brought up in terms of uh, educational pricing, enterprise pricing, et cetera, there's uh, different support plans. There's also a history of support for software that's very different than it is for physical products. And there's reputational uh, things to consider as well. I mean, we have a member, Drinkmate, that actually made an overt attempt to have an open license for people to create different versions of the implementation software on what was essentially a personal breath breathalyzer device, right? And what they found over time is that they weren't able to uh, maintain a standard of quality among these sort of publicly provided versions of the software to devices, and they suffered a reputational harm as a result, and had to, and were only enabled to because of it being a license, to bring that back in-house and make sure that only their software was associated with those devices so that they could recuperate from that reputational harm that they suffered. So I mean, I think there's a lot that's unique about software. I think as we move forward into um, uh, the Internet of Things and embedded software and devices, you're going to see more experimentation in business models. And some of the legacy practices will start to fall away because some of the legacy dangers will fall away at the same time. But I think all of that is going to happen much more quickly in a much more dynamic fashion than any kind of legislative effort would happen. So the ex again, as we said in the last panel, I think that the existing mechanisms that are in place, both in terms of contract law and and and, and copyright exceptions, uh, provide a more fluid and a better uh, place to deal with these issues than some kind of legislative solution. Mr. Perzanowski, I think you've been, and then we'll go to Mr. Valkyrie. Um, so there are a couple of distinctions that I think are useful to draw um, that I think at some points in our discussion have been confused. So. First, I think we need to distinguish between licensing software and licensing copies of software. Those are two very different things. Um, I also think we have to distinguish uh, between questions of interpreting and enforcing contracts on the one hand, and what I think should be the crucial question for this discussion, 
which is how we determine whether a transfer of ownership has occurred when it comes to particular copies of software, right? And in one place I think it makes sense to look is the statute itself. You know, unfortunately, I mean, maybe for better or maybe for worse, the Copyright Act does not define ownership in the context of consumers. It doesn't define transfers of ownership. But there is language that's useful in this interpretive question, and that language is in 106.3 itself, right? 106.3 defines the kinds of <clears throat> distributions that copyright law recognizes when it comes to particular copies. And it divides the universe into two kinds of distributions. There are sales and other transfers of ownership on the one hand, and there is rental, lease, and lending on the other. So every transfer of a copy, every distribution of a copy is either a transfer of ownership or it's a rental, a lease, or a lending. That's really clear from the statute. Um, so the question is, if someone wants to license a copy, which one is it? And I think if you look at it from that perspective, it's actually a much easier question to answer. Um, you know, the idea of a licensed copy um, is really a myth, right? That's not a real thing. It's not a transactional form that, that the Copyright Act recognizes. Um, you might say that there are certain kinds of leases or rentals or lendings that you want to use the label license to characterize, um, but there's no such thing as a licensed copy. The software industry has been pretty successful in convincing some courts that that's a real thing. But well, how would you, ex how would, sorry, how would you explain why is then, where they essentially had perpetual uh, possession of the movie, the, the film prints, but under restrictions in the courts. So there. you're talking about Wise. Yeah, Wise. So we could character, we could look at the facts of Wise and say uh, that that is, uh, that that is a lease, that that is a lending, that there are certain restrictions, right? So what is it that separates uh, a transfer of ownership from one of these other kind of, kinds of more temporary, uh, time-limited transactions? And it might be an ongoing obligation to pay. Uh, it might be that there is some sort of durational limit, right? At some point, you've got to give the thing back. Um, that fits, I think, reasonably well into the common understanding of uh, leasing or rental, right? Um, it's not a transfer of ownership if, when the thing is given to you, it is made explicitly clear that at a certain point you have to return the item, you have to destroy the item. That's not a transfer of ownership, right? Ownership entails perpetual possession, no ongoing obligation to pay. When those two factors are present, what you have is a transfer of ownership. Right. So is it your position that both Werner and Krauss are incorrect? Not, not the decision, but the reasoning of both of those cases is incorrect? Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that the reasoning in Werner is incorrect. I think the reasoning in Krauss is less clear than it should be, although I, I'm... Um, but Krauss acknowledged that there could be... Li I mean, it didn't find a license in that case, but it acknowledged that there could be licenses. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think the conceptual framework that courts use to answer this question is confused. Um, a, couple of other, uh, a couple of other points here. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that came up is, you know, what's the value of a license uh, that purports to deny a transfer of ownership to uh, a consumer? And there's a lot of value there. Uh, it's, it's value that I think we should question from an overall uh, social utility standpoint, right? It's about restricting resale. Uh, it's about controlling uh, aftermarket products. Uh, it is about uh, controlling the market for services. Uh, it might be about price discrimination, and we can have a debate about the merits of price discrimination. Um, there are other means other than denying consumers the right to own the things that they purchase to achieve price discrimination. I think it's worth pointing out that, su that the Supreme Court was really clear in curtsaying uh, that price discrimination is not among the rights that copyright holders get to, uh, uh, get to enjoy by virtue of their copyright. Uh, so but, if we're but thinking- But you would acknowledge that there are, I mean, this is sort of like basic economics, right? I mean, there are consumer benefits to allowing for price discrimination. There certainly can be, 
I, I, but I would not say that price discrimination is necessarily overall uh, to the benefit of consumers. There are certain circumstances where price discrimination is, in fact, very useful for consumers. Um, but denying consumers ownership and, and in, in imposing ongoing copyright obligations is not the only way to price discriminate. There are lots of industries that price discriminate that don't use copyright law whatsoever. Um, and you know, I think we've seen in the wake of Kurt Sang uh, that price discrimination in the, uh, in the market for academic textbooks uh, continues. There are other ways of achieving that goal. One way of achieving that goal is to not sell products to people, right? Um, don't engage in transactions that look like sales. Engage in transactions that look like subscriptions, that look like rentals. Uh, you know, my students have the option to get their casebooks uh, in law school uh, on a rental model, right? Or on an ongoing subscription model. That at least is an honest way of engaging with consumers. You're not characterizing a transaction as a sale when in fact you don't believe that it's a sale. Um, you know, those kinds of transactions carry with them expectations that consumers think they're getting a certain set of rights when they buy a product, right? When you go <clears throat> and you buy that new refrigerator, you think you own it. You don't think you're entering into an ongoing relationship with a service provider, right? That's what you do with your cable company. Um, I'll, I won't say um, more about what people think of their cable companies. Um, you know, but when you buy a refrigerator, you think you own it. Uh, you think you have a certain set of rights. I just, I have a study uh, that was just published uh, last Friday uh, that looks at this question in the context of digital media, that looks at the buy now button used prominently by Amazon and Apple uh, and finds that consumers believe they have the right to engage in resale with digital media that they buy now uh, to uh, lend that digital media to others, uh, to give it away, to leave it in their will, right? Uh, so when you set up a transaction, when you present it to consumers uh, in the context of a sale, they have expectations about what they're getting. And the fact that some license agreement that no one in their right mind would invest the time to read, uh, you know, includes terms to the contrary, does not change those consumer expectations, right? Um, so this isn't to say that we can't allow for flexible business models that give software companies uh, the, kinds of, uh, uh, the kinds of protections that they think they need. You can look at what Adobe has done with its creative suite over the last few years. You can't buy it anymore. You can pay Adobe $50 a month for the rest of your life if you're a creative professional to use their software. And in a lot of ways, I think that was a really smart decision on their part, right? Um, it avoids the problems that they saw with resale. Um, it allows them a, a you know, more predictable revenue stream. Uh, it allows them to deliver product updates to consumers in a more effective way. And it's a really honest transaction. You know what you're getting from, uh, from the outset. So is this a problem that's going to diminish as we go forward because as we move you know, more and more into kind of cloud-based services, um, the sort of the sort of problems that you've identified are, are kind of problems of the moment. But you know, we have Office 365. There's like all sorts of other ways in which we're now software software is moving into like cloud-based subscription models. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in some ways, and the, the reason I'm asking that is because you know, if we're look, looking ahead, yeah. if we're probably if we're solving yesterday's problem, it doesn't make very much sense. So I'm it, sorry. Can I just add one point on top of that? I mean, the Adobe example you, you cite is a good one, but uh, sort of the logic behind your, your, your argument is that uh, the physicality of the Adobe product is gone. There is no longer a CD that you're purchasing. It's you're just simply downloading the product, as opposed to your refrigerator, which is physical in every sense of the word, and it's going to be with you for a long time. So is there a distinction there? Yeah, well, I think in the Adobe example, you're not buying anything, right? That transaction is absolutely on the rental, lease, or lending side of this divide in Section 106.3. Um, so I don't think there's any good argument that the consumer owns anything. Um, you know, they're paying for a service. Um, in terms of whether this is yesterday's problem or, or tomorrow's problem, in some ways I think for, for markets for pure software products, um, we are going to see a move in this direction towards uh, cloud-based uh, services. 
the area where I think we need to, to be focusing, as, as I think we are here today, is what happens uh, when we see software embedded in everyday products that consumers use every day, right? There, there is necessarily a kind of uh, a, a physical um, embodiment of the work and of the product. And so uh, in those circumstances, I don't think you can, you can escape these questions, right? Because uh, the, the nature of the product uh, embeds that kind of physicality. And unless we start to see which I'm, I'm doubtful uh, about, unless we start to see a really explicit shift to now you don't buy your home appliances, you lease your home appliances, we're going to have to face this question of who owns the software that makes that product work, right? The software is just as important to the functioning of your car or your new smart refrigerator or your smart TV as any of the physical components. So to tell consumers, sure, you own the plastic and you own uh, the chips uh, and you own the display, but the thing that actually makes the thing work, the thing that actually makes the thing valuable, someone else controls that. That puts consumers in a really precarious situation, right? Think about, uh, I, I missed uh, the beginning of the first panel, so I'm sure someone has already mentioned Revolve, uh, but look at what happened with that device. Consumers went out, they bought this device for $300, this home automation hub, um, they thought they owned it. They thought they got to use it as long as they wanted until one day they got a message that said, oh, that thing you bought, that's a brick, right? It's useless now because they don't own and they don't control the software that makes it operate. That puts consumers in a really precarious position. So, you know, I'm worried about a future where consumers have this illusion of ongoing personal property rights that they've enjoyed, you know, for centuries. Uh, but what's really going on, and what they will learn only when it is too late, is that they really have no control over the, the objects that surround them and, th and that they rely on. Um, so first I'm going to announce that we're extending the panel since there are some really good um, you know, thoughts being discussed, but, and, and, um, but going sort of towards what you've been talking about, how has, and, and this is for you and everyone else, sort of how has this played out in the market. Um, I think you mentioned, I don't know if this is sort of um, actual data, but that the, the possibility of, of the refrigerator and that if consumers are unhappy with the, the restrictions that come with that refrigerator, that they can just buy a refrigerator from a, a, a different seller. Um, and, you know, th in the comments there is the example of the Keurig device where people were upset with the restrictions sort of set forth by Keurig and they decided for PR reasons to, to move forward in a different direction. So I'm, I'm really curious sort of how the market, uh, you know, plays out in this sphere. I, I think the short answer is it's too early to tell. Um, you know, this is all developing um, as we speak. There have been instances where consumers were up in arms enough about a particular restriction that they could, uh, that they could effectively um, you know, move the needle in terms of how a company responds. There have been other examples where that hasn't been the case. Uh, frankly, the, the big problem is these restrictions do not become clear to consumers uh, until they are faced with a device that doesn't behave as they expect it to, right? Uh, so, you know, the Revolve is, I think, the, the clearest and most recent example of that. It's not the only one of the comment that I submitted includes uh, a long list of consumer devices where these kinds of problems have presented themselves. Um, so it, it, I'm, I'm not willing today to, to say that the market is going to be capable of solving these problems. I think in some instances it will and in many it won't. Um, so why don't we move on to um, Mr. Bockert. So I think just, if you just turn on your microphone. Please. Sorry. So the, the refrigerator example is a good one. And you confront a variation of the problem or, or this issue in almost every merger and acquisition where you have a buyer going in and saying, I want all your, your refrigerators and, you know, in this facility. And, you know, in the back of your mind, you're like, well, each of these refrigerators has the software in it that when you press the button, it shoots out the ice, right? And you go to the seller and you say, I'd love to see the, the license that covers the software that shoots out the ice in your refrigerators. And the seller, of course, says, I either had it and I lost it, or it doesn't exist at all. They just don't know. And then as a buyer, you have to ask the question, you know, 
am I allowed to acquire this? Is now the owner of that software going to hold me up, hold up the transaction, and perhaps have a um, you know a, a special transaction fee just to allow it to go through? And you know, in refrigerators, it may be an easy example because it's like s small amounts of money. But the larger the product gets, it you know we can start adding up a lot more money, and. I think the idea is we already have, you know, concepts, especially, you know, imported from patent law, like the doctrine of exhaustion, where we can say maybe in certain cases with software, when it's embedded in a consumer product and it acts in a certain way in that consumer product, maybe the doctrine of exhaustion can apply. So we can say, look, you know, this is what it's doing in that refrigerator. Therefore, you know, the sale can go on. It runs with the, the good. Um, and why don't we move back this way. Um, Mr. Zuck. Uh, sure. I, I, I know we're uh, running a little bit long. I guess, again, I get, I get back to the notion that um, there's a lot of dynamism sort of in the marketplace. And so if you look at TiVo as another example, they were, they were practically giving away hardware that was in conjunction with software as a service that allowed for programming and, and uh, storage of uh, content. And so, I mean, embedded in that business model was sort of like basically subsidizing the hardware with what was a software license. And I, I, again, I think that um, you're going to potentially see things like that with refrigerators, that there's a, there's a service or, a, you know, you, you are connected to Weight Watchers or something like that associated with your refrigerator and, and its monitoring capabilities. And I, I can't foresee what all of those business models are going to be, but I can imagine them. And I think to some extent we're going to have to rely on requirements for notice and things like that to take the place of trying to jigger the law around. And again, I come back to that being the fundamental question you're asking is whether or not there's some fundamental change to be made to copyright law to accommodate what is an incredibly dynamic market with incredibly dynamic business models. And as I said, as the risks associated with piracy change, as the needs for consumers change, I think the market will will evolve in such a way that it'll address these things. I, I mean, the, the number of people that are really affected by the f by, by the license agreement in a refrigerator and their inability to sell it, uh, at least to date, uh, is, is non-existent, right? I mean, people uh, have been selling devices and cars to each other that have software embedded in them for the most part. And so, again, until we really have an identifiable problem, I think we shouldn't be looking ahead to the solution because we'll get it wrong. And Mr. Moore. Um, two, two, two responses, I guess, two, two hopefully pretty quick points. Um, all right, well, so the first, the first has to do with the idea of licensing copies uh, on which the entire uh, open source and software industry is, is based. Um, a, a wise man once said, and I, I think it was John Band, um, <laughs> that, you know, <clears throat> it, it, if, if all the courts come out against you, you you've, got to you've got to entertain the, uh, the possibility that you're wrong. <laughs> Um, and in, the, in this particular instance, I mean, that's the way all of the cases have come out. That's, you know, that is the, that's the, that's the legal reality we live in. That's the reality that's worked quite well. Again, it's the, it's the model that open source depends on and a lot of our other members depend on to make money. Um, the second thing I would suggest is to be careful, very careful when you analyze these issues about getting confused between issues of consumer protection and issues of copyright law. So it is true that if you, in certain circumstances, in a specific transactional context, that the presence of a buy now button could convey an impression that is misleading or deceptive. Um, and it is also true, the same can be said of many things, for example, uh, campaign commercials. It does not follow from that that there is any problem with the copyright system whatsoever. And I think it's important to draw that line between um, a particular practice in a particular context. And this is one of the things that the PTO is going to look at because this came up in the context of their, um, of their study and some kind of inherent problem with licensing itself. I think those are two very different inquiries. That's it. Mr. Harbison. Um, I, I want to go back to the refrigerator uh, and, and point out that, yes, the, the consumer can go find a different refrigerator if she has a problem with the licensing, but she still needs the refrigerator, 
and if all of the refrigerators can carry that some kind of unacceptable license, she's out of luck. Now, to, to use that to, to once again beg the, the room's indulgence, in the case of a sound recording of a musical work, it's the only sound recording. It's, it's, a, it's a monopoly. This is why it's, this is related to copyright. Um, the, uh, 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 if, if you're the only, if, if you have the exclusive right to that particular sound recording and my library needs that particular sound recording, there is no other way I can get it. Um, that's where th where the, the the consumer protections fail. It's it, 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 the, the, there is no way for for the, the library to serve this material. Um, and the, the another thing that I've heard brought up, but it may have been in an earlier panel, and I'm sorry if it was, but the the idea that the uh, software licenses are. The, well, the, the, the software products are updated so fast and their lifespan is so short that they, they really aren't, um, they, they aren't a long-term problem, but with, with sound recordings, which last hopefully hundreds of years, in some cases they've lasted more than a hundred anyway, um, a license that doesn't have an expiration will become a problem for a very long time. Uh, and so, so, so Again, I, I really would like to encourage everyone to think about this as a problem that's much bigger than simply software-enabled consumer products. The, I, the, the, the folks that I represent are not, do not have a problem with licensing per se. The, the, the idea of, of an, a, an iTunes model providing licensed copies, begging your pardon, to, the, to consumers directly for 99 cents and, and having all of those terms and conditions is not actually our problem. The problem is when, when libraries specifically are, are excluded from, from that, that process and are unable to include culturally extremely significant works in our collections and those, those works die out as soon as the service dies out. Um, okay, thank you. Oh, and, uh, so I want to address the, the issue of um, you know, whether you should go out and buy another product. When you purchase a vehicle, you're spending thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for that car. The, the information that's available to you about the repair of that car, the licensing, is not ent entirely apparent to you until, until you have to actually go through it. And then you find you're, you're you know, now subject to the fact that you don't own that vehicle. The the licensing hasn't really occurred in, in the motor vehicle area, but it, it's part of the 1201 discussions that car companies raised the fact that they felt that when you purchased a car, you were the owner was licensing that software and didn't necessarily own the software that was on that, on that vehicle. That created a huge firestorm in itself and in, within our industry and with consumers. And I think that um, you know cars are, are around for multiple years. What happens to those cars? They change hands. Parts are taken off those cars with software on them, and then they're remanufactured by um, individual companies that then, what happens to that software? Can they reuse that software on that remanufactured part? Because um, the part itself needs to have that software to operate. Those are all questions that I, that I think are, that need to be answered as well. But I, I don't believe that you know, you can simply say that you're going to um, just buy a, if you buy a Ford, you don't like the whole deal, you could go out and buy a, a, a Chrysler next time because simply you're, you're pretty much stuck with that car for a while and the, the servicing of that vehicle. Do you feel like the, the market in that area hasn't um, addressed those issues? I recall sort of there being some press on um, some of the car companies. Mm -hmm. Considering those issues and, and those concerns and, and coming to, I believe it was a memorandum of understanding when it comes to, you know. Uh, yeah, we came to yeah. a memorandum of understanding on, on the right to repair, which meant that all the information tools and software are supposed to be available to a repair shop to be able to repair their car, but that doesn't necessarily cover the part itself. Mr. Kubushnitz. Thank you, and I guess uh, maybe we can talk about a different product other than refrigerators so close to lunchtime. I don't know about you, I'm getting a little hungry. Um, to, to address a, a, a few points that Professor Pernowski, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, uh, discussed, um, he had some, took some issue with the Werner case, but at the same point talked about uh, 
how you distinguish lending from a sale and the fact that lending, uh, and I'm pretty sure this is a quote, there are certain limitations. If you look at the Verner case, it sets apart a three, there's a three-pronged test, and that includes that the license include limitations on the transfer, but also limitations on use. Um, and that would sort of seem to, to satisfy that, um, that requirement. It was also raised um, about, you know, the question, are we trying to solve yesterday's problems? And I could not agree more with that. For some reason, we have this fascination, love affair with destruction and return of the product um, and, and hitting the buy now or buy button uh, and people or consumers are confused about that. I, I think it depends on the, on the consumers. I think if you were to have my 17-year-old son sitting here instead of me, I think he'd say there's no confusion whatsoever because he's grown up in an environment that's very different. Um, if um, you, you look at, I mean, and this, this issue is not specific to copyright either. If you hit the buy button when you're buying a seat on an airplane, but I don't think anybody thinks that they're actually buying that seat. Um, uh, and so I, I think that terminology has just been um, used because it's, it's easier for, the, for consumers to understand. We talk about these sort of long EULAs and long licenses, and it's so difficult for consumers uh, to understand. Well, the idea is everyone's trying to make it easier for consumers, and if you have these long descriptions of the, the, within the button, I think that would certainly make it more, uh, more, more difficult. Um, and then just the last thing I just reiterate, um, which, is, which is already said, to the extent that the software licenses embedded in software, because remember, that's what we're talking about here, are, uh, are being misused or abused, the market uh, is and will be self-correcting. In our comments, we mentioned the Keurig example, okay? Um, and and that, that applies here. If you're engaging, if, a, if a, uh, a software or a hardware manufacturer is engaging in sort of anti-consumer behavior, they're not going to be around very long. And if the manufacturer is dealing with a software company and that software company is just trying to enforce their license in a way that the manufacturer isn't, and the device manufacturer isn't particularly pleased with, well, then that relationship's not going to last very long either. So there are, in terms of the market um, and relationships, there are self-correcting mechanisms in there if, in fact, these problems uh, were to continue to occur or conter, um, uh, occur going into the future. Uh, Mr. Band? So a, a lot of people have raised the issue of sort of the, 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 that, that there's this continuing relationship that you're really not getting uh, software as a uh, product, but it's software as a device. And that certainly might be true with respect to some of the software in, in the devices that we're talking about. I mean, it could very well be that in your computer that there is one piece of software that is compute, you know, communicating to the central server somewhere in the sky and telling them that you are, you know, eating too much. Um, but, but, uh, uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of other software in the refrigerator, and certainly a lot of other software in the car, and all of these replace all, all of these parts that Mr. Lowe has been talking about that communicate with one another, um, where they're not interacting with a uh, with a, you know with the cloud, that they're just interacting with other parts of the car, um, and uh, and and you'll have the software that's interacting with other parts of the refrigerator, and I think it's. Um, uh, I, I think it's important to sort of uh, try to keep these issues, you know, keep those separate. Because I, I agree that if you, if there is an ongoing relationship, that poses different issues. Now, part of the, you know, there's a related issue is like, are you paying for the ongoing relationship? Certainly, if you're paying, you know, the subscription fee every month, that's one thing. If there's a sort of a paid-up license at the beginning, you know, paid-up, paid-up license at the beginning where it's understood that you're, you know, for the life of the refrigerator, it will always be communicating with the cloud. That's, you know, that might be a different situation. And maybe in that case, you know, you, know, you, you, you have, uh, you know, the person who bought the refrigerator has a different bundle of rights. But it certainly seems to me that if we're talking about sort of software that is, uh, you know, the, 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 where there, there is no, ongoing relationship, I mean, that seems to be a much easier case to say, okay, let's figure out how to deal with that situation. In other words, 
you know, there's, there's a bit of a spectrum here, a spectrum of relationship. There could be situations where there's absolutely none. There could be a situation where there's a very tight relationship with an ongoing subscription. Um, and then you have situations in the middle where there might be some sort of ongoing relationship, but it's all paid up. And those are three very different situations that, that I think can be. So do you think that, I mean, to me, that suggests that, <clears throat> that then we should be very careful about trying to establish rules in this area and that maybe it's something that we should let courts sort out on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, do you disagree with that? Uh, yes, uh, because I, th I think it is possible to come up with rules. Uh, certainly, where there is no ongoing relationship whatsoever, I think that's a very easy case. Uh, you know, and we could come up with rules today. And in fact, you know, to some extent, that's what uh, uh, Yoda tries to do that. It tried to be very careful. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, in the conversations with Congressman Vernthold's office that, you know, came up is, is exactly this. Well, what about, what about the updates, right? And so there were some folks who said, well, you know, if you, you know, and again, we were only dealing with uh, the, the, the contemplations only when, when you have a paid up license, when it's all, you know, you pay once up front, no ongoing payments. And so should you be, when you sell it to the, you know, the, when, it's, when the device is sold to the second person, what do they get in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of the software going forward? And there were some folks who were very interested in saying, well, you should be able to get whatever the first person, whatever the first purchaser would, would have gotten if it had stayed in that person's possession. So to the extent that there would have been ongoing updates, then you know, the, second, you know, the second purchaser should be able to get everything that the first purchaser had bought. Uh, would, would have gotten, um, but actually, uh, you know, you know, those the the, the ultimate uh, uh, conclusion um, again, not not necessarily that our members would have wanted was that no, you only get uh, uh, bug fixes and uh, security patches. You don't get the new releases, um, so that you're you know that there's that you are even though you would have paid up front and if it had stayed with the first person they would have gotten any new release, the idea is that you know because the sense was that there is this ongoing relationship and it's sort of different that that you don't get all of you don't get the full bundle you get less. But the point is is that these are these are lines that Congress is perfectly capable of drawing. And that line seems particular. That seems like a very con a very difficult line to apply in practice. If I'm a software company, you know, oftentimes I'm bundling bug fixes with up with you know new releases. So I'm adding new features and I'm adding bug fixes, and sometimes they're sort of integrated. So, well, so yeah. if the corporate office wants to recommend that it should just be you should get everything the first purchaser wanted, and you know that you should get all the new releases. That would be great. I mean, you know, but that, again, goes back to the question of whether there's, like, a practical concern here. I mean, you know, I was just looking on eBay to see if I could buy a used Nest thermostat, and you can. And I'm not – so the, so going again to this fact that this is about consumer products, if there's not a problem, a demonstrated problem in the marketplace, I'm not sure – looking at it from Congress's perspective, that they're particularly would be interested in trying to jump into this kind of thorny issue. So again, I, I, just to reiterate, I, to the extent we have specific examples of this occurring in the context of consumer devices, uh, not in the context of sort of business-to-business -business type transactions, I think that would be something we'd be very interested in finding out about. Mr. Bergmeier. OK. Uh, you know, just, just for the record, open source software is not dependent on licensing copies. It's dependent on licensing intellectual property rights that the licensee otherwise would not have and placing conditions on those rights, which is totally legit. So, for example, the GPL grants to the licensee the right to make reproductions or the right to make derivative works. Licensees don't otherwise have those rights, so putting conditions on those is fine, and I don't have an objection to that. Uh, those licenses do not depend on saying that the ultimate user does not own a copy of the software in question. I think that is a very important distinction. Second, um, I think, you know, let's say for the sake of argument that I own this iPhone. When I install an app on it, I think I own a copy of that app. A copy is defined 
in the statue as a material thing. The only material thing I see is the iPhone, therefore I necessarily own a copy. I don't think there are negative consequences of that for the software developer. What does it mean? It means I can operate the software without needing a specific license by virtue of the essential step test, the essential step doctrine, which says that I'm entitled to make RAM copies that are necessary to use physical items that I own. I don't think that's bad for software developers. And it might mean that first sale applies, but as a practical matter in today's uh, technological environment, what am I going to do? Sell my entire phone, including my iTunes account? Uh, that's really not going to happen. Happen. Um, I think it could happen if I were to sell my iPhone, including my iTunes store account that it's tied to, I think I should be allowed to do that, and I think that's where first sale would kick in. But as a practical matter, uh, you know, first sale doesn't entitle me to make arbitrary numbers of new copies and resell them. It doesn't entitle me to engage in piracy in any respect. In fact, the main thing that saying that I own a copy of software that I bought, even in the case of uh, an Adobe Creative Cloud situation, is simply to say, that simply by virtue of owning it, I don't need a license just to use it. It doesn't grant any new rights. It doesn't necessarily even entitle me to software updates in the future. And I don't think that is bad for, the, for uh, software developers. And I have a hard time seeing why there is such resistance to this concept, uh, which is grounded in the plain text of the statute that, one, copies are material items. And two, if I own the material item, I own the copy. I don't. I have a very difficulty, a very, very much difficulty in seeing uh, the resistance to that, except for the fact that by saying that you don't own the copy, that uh, brings up the RAM copies doctrine, and it allows you to put all kinds of restrictions and sort of gin up copyright violations for what otherwise be uh, routine contract violations. So those are my two final points. So, so again, is it your is it your position? I mean, I'll ask uh, you the same question I asked Mr. Perzanowski before. Is it is it your view that both, in, in a sense, both Krauss and Werner had it wrong when they suggested that there could be licenses for software? In the case that I don't own software, it's because I don't own the material item. So when you're saying that I don't own the film, that means I don't own the film stock. There's no third way. There's IP rights and there's material copies. There's no like ethereal copy that is somehow apart from the material object and has nothing to do with the traditional 106 rights. Yeah, no, I understand that point. Uh, but, but, but both Krauss and um, Werner proceeded from the assumption that there could be licenses in copies. And they reached different results at the end of the day, looking at the facts. But so, I think they both had that same basic so understanding. So I think to use the, the helpful terminology, in any of those cases, if you're saying that I've licensed a copy, what you're saying is that the material object is something that I don't really own because I'm just borrowing it or something. And that's, that's fine. And that's, that's not unique to software. All right, thank you. And we'll conclude with Mr. Perzanowski. I'll, I'll try to be really brief. So I, I, I want to come back to the point that Chris made, which I think is really important. And I agree that for the most part, these kinds of false advertising concerns that I've raised are legally distinct from the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer here. There is one way that I do think they're relevant. And it comes back to a point I think you made earlier, which is that you know one of the reasons that the software cases seem to come out differently from the other kinds of, uh, uh, you know, um, license versus sale questions with other types of media is that maybe we think there's something different about business practices, uh, about the history, and about consumer expectations in software markets. I'm not entirely convinced of that argument. If that's true, though, it cuts both ways, right? If consumers are used to licenses when it comes to standalone software, they're not used to licenses when it comes to refrigerators, right? So we should think about that, that line of reasoning not only in terms of how it applies looking backward, but in terms of how it applies looking forward into, into areas where consumers have no expectation whatsoever of licensing and whether there is no history of a practice of licensing. Um, to come back to, to Keith's point, the great thing about doing empirical research is you don't have to suppose or imagine you get like answers to questions. Um, and it turns out that young white men are in fact more confused than anyone about what the buy now button means. And it turns out that providing a bullet pointed short notice significantly reduces the degree to which consumers misunderstand their rights. Um, the paper's up on SSRN. Uh, if anybody's interested, I'd recommend uh, you read it because uh, I, I do think there's value from having real evidence uh, and, and not just imagining the way the world might be. Great, so we're gonna take a 15 minute break. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.